Over the past three weeks, we've been taking a journey through the books of Timothy, and I've been really enjoying it. Ian's spoken about the importance of prayer and how to incorporate that into your life. And David spoke last week on using your power not to bring people down, but to empower others and to raise them up. Now, First and Second Timothy contain a lot of really, really helpful stuff, lots of good stuff. In fact, when I was trying to work out what I'd speak on today, I think I've got about three or four sermons in reserve off the same seven verses that were read today. So I was really curious, I got curious about why was all this good stuff in First and Second Timothy? So me being me, I did a bit of research. And the books of Timothy are Paul's letters to Timothy. The first letter, or the first book of Timothy, was written when Timothy was the leader of the church in Ephesus. And so it contained a lot of advice on how to run a church. Second Timothy is very, very different feeling. Second Timothy was written while Paul was in prison. He was chained, he was suffering, and he was of the belief that his life was soon to end. And in fact, the scholars are of the agreement that Second Timothy was the last thing that Paul had written. So this is the lens we've got. We've got a man who is really suffering, he's chained, and instead of bitching and whinging and moaning, he is a driven man to write to Timothy and tell him how to live his life, to pass something on. So we've got, a, you can see a great deal of passion comes through in this, in this book. So in the reading, Paul is talking about the freedom of God's word. So he, whilst he himself was chained, God's word, he had a strong belief, would set him free. He had a marvellous relationship with God, and this relationship was supporting him through his time in prison. And towards the end, Paul exhorts Timothy to do his best to present him to self to God as one approved. And I just thought, well, what does, what does that mean? I know what all the individual words mean, but when you add it up together, what are we being asked to do? Well, what Paul is asking Timothy to do is to live a life that reflects the teaching of the Lord so that when you are before God, you can say, God, I have, I have lived my life as you have asked me to do. So I've been curious for a while about my relationship with God because I was raised in, probably I was a church in the 70s, so God was an awe-inspiring figure. He was all-knowing, all-seeing, Lord and Master of all. And he is indeed all of those things. And he still is to me. But that picture, when you look at it, was combined with a guy that was out there. And the words, you might be familiar with them, you might have heard of them, the big guy in the sky. Um, but I'd, I'd sort of internalised this view of God. He was out there, up there, majestic, all-knowing, all-seeing, never made a mistake, but somehow very unapproachable. Not very, you know, he was, he was the Lord that I would bow to and worship. Would he be interested in um, what was going on for me? Which is why often for a long time, I'm really interested in Jesus because he came down and he lived among us and he probably got in trouble for not cleaning up his room too. So, but God was somewhat different. So I started wondering what a relationship with God might look like. And then I started thinking, what do my relationships with others look like? Now this is a, a wondering and a conversation I've been having with myself for years. 
and it's very much ongoing. And um, I still struggle with a lot of aspects of it. So I even when I started looking at what would my relationships look like, I started with a thought of what is a relationship anyway. Now, in my late 20s, my concept of what a relationship was underwent, or it started to undergo a massive change. So I used to hide the parts of me that were less than perfect, that were untidy. And so whenever anybody spoke to me, life was going fine. What I didn't speak about was that I was living alone in my late 20s. I couldn't do the housework. Housework was really difficult for me. And something else that was really difficult for me was cooking. I, I, I'm actually a, quite a decent cook, but I found it really difficult to cook and feed myself. So I was, in fact, having takeout every night. But I'd never tell anyone that. My life was perfect, and if anyone else had problems, I was the girl to go to for solutions. So um, I st this, this, as you can, might, might think, didn't really work that well for me over the long term. And I started very slowly to change. Now, a lot of the change occurred, some of it occurred around me meeting my husband that I spoke about earlier. And a lot of it started to happen around the change when I was pregnant with my daughter. I worked very long hours and I was starting to feel quite anxious about the impending loss of control. So I spoke to people about that. I didn't know how to manage my job, which previously I'd managed just by working long hours. So I spoke about, I got someone to help me with that too. And then my daughter arrived, and because she has her own schedule, she was two weeks late. That drove me insane. And uh, my life was really messy. And so I'm sitting at home, and I, and I just thought, oh, what am I going to do? I need some more support. So I fought my way into a mother's group. And I, I hopped in the car, and I drove there. I hadn't driven for a while. And I got there, and we started going around. Now, I, I th a lot of you would be familiar with a mother's group. But for those who aren't, in Australia, when you give birth, you go to your local, the, the government puts on a, a group where you go and you sit down with all the other women that have had children about the same time as you and you share your experiences and they're to be your support network when you go through as your child grows. And so I turned up and I was desperate for a bit of support because I was thinking, how can life be, be like this? It's so messy, it's so disorganised. I couldn't put my daughter down. She wanted to be carried all the time. I was working um, between 1 a.m. and 3 a.m. to keep my practice going, because that was the only time I could get any work done. And neither my daughter or I would sleep after the 1 a.m. feed. So that's just what I did. And I was thinking, surely there has to be a better way, or maybe I'm just the, am I the only one living like this? So I went to mother's group, I was, I was desperate. And so you get this picture, I managed to get there with my clothes, didn't have too much vomit on them or anything like that. I got there, I sat down, and in the mother's group, you go around and you introduce yourself and you talk about how the parenting is going for you. And I was about speaker number four. So, the first woman spoke. Her baby had slept through the night from the end of the first week. And he would feed in five minutes. And I... <laughs> And I'm like, oh, okay, but she might be special. The next woman spoke. Oh, she was doing pretty good too. She was loving motherhood. It was a dream. I'm like, okay, there's still one more chance, one more chance. The next woman spoke, and she was going hunky-dory too. And I'm sitting there thinking, my life is a complete and absolute utter mess. And that's when I faced a turning point. Did I say to this group what was actually going on for me, or did I just gloss over it all and say, yeah, I love motherhood too, look at my beautiful daughter? Um, and so when we look at this reading, Paul exhorts us or tells us that we need to endure. 
and there is a very big, uh, well, there's a saying that we all know, I imagine, it's called to suffer in silence. And I thought, you know, should I be suffering in silence? Well, if you have a look at the, at the passage, Paul isn't suffering in silence. Paul is telling us he's suffering, he is chained. He speaks elsewhere openly that he believes he's going to be killed. He knows this is his last time on earth. So he's speaking to everybody about that through the letter. And I, and I looked up the word endure. What does the word endure mean? Well, it had an interesting meaning. It's just to hold on, to hang in there, to persist, to survive. There is nothing in that uh, meaning of that word that you need to sit silently and not, and not say to people what is going on. There's also another very lovely verse that I just adore. And you'll know it when I say it too. It's just, the truth will set you free. And I think that is true in more than, more than just the context it was given. And that's a really wise verse to live your life by. So if we have a look at it, whilst we're required to endure or we're asked to endure and you hang in there and you ask God for help, you are not required to do so and paint a pretty picture. But what did I do? Well, I tell you, I took a deep breath and then I said how it was. I told everybody how messy it was. And the result was amazing. There was this big collective sigh. Everybody's shoulders went, ah. And you know what? Everybody after me, it wasn't looking that great for them either. <laughs> and even better, most but not all of the three women who spoke before me, you know what? It wasn't going that great for them either. So that's what I learned, that we actually we actually connect to others through the broken bits and the imperfections. That's how you have a real relationship with people. And when you're able to disclose to people these things about ourselves that we'd rather keep locked inside, you know then, if they've not rejected you when you tell them that, they're not going to reject you later down the track if you need some help. And so I say to you that that is the relationship that God has with us. He is up for that, as it were. He knows all of your imperfections. He knows all of your messy bits. He can see them all, and he is still there. And Paul says in the, in the verse that um, he will remain, God will remain faithful to us. So what we had once we had disclosed that in Mother's Group was a relationship that actually really supported us through the growing up of our, of, our, of our children. So that's one side of the coin of the relationships, the support in times of darkness and in times of difficulty. But there's another side. It's the celebration when things are going right. And what joy and what special understanding there can be in a celebration, in a relationship when you know the difficult things with someone. When you celebrate the successes, it means even more because people know exactly what you've gone through to achieve that goal. So I started thinking, well, look, I, I ask God a lot for help when times are tough. Um, and if I had a friend who came to me for help and I gave them that help, I supported them through all of, um, all of their times of difficulty, but when something went good that I'd helped them do, they didn't thank me. Not that thanks is required, but you do this for another, a lot of other things and a lot of other reasons, but how would I feel? And I thought, you know what, I wouldn't feel that great in that, in that situation. I wouldn't desert the friend, I wouldn't leave them, but I wouldn't feel that great. 
And so I started an experiment. I decided that I'd treat God more like somebody that I'd have a regular relationship with, like a friend. Because most friendships have, have a solid foundation of regular contact. Not all, but most. And I think my relationship with God was more like that friend you speak to every year or every couple of years. And when you catch up, it's like you've never been apart. And I thought, well, mm, okay. So I started my relationship with God more like a regular person. And what I tried to do was thank him and notice when things happened that were going well. And to try and get that regular contact. Now what I'm struggling with is, is very much that regular contact. So that's still very much a work in progress. But it, it was about for me, and it still is about to me, exploring a relationship with God that takes him out of being the big guy in the sky and brings him down to someone that I have a personal relationship with that I talk to about everything that's going on in my life. Now, church is very helpful for providing sort of a template for your relationship with God. If you look at it, church gives us people to help us in our journey. Prayer, it's simply a conversation with God. Sometimes I think there's a lot of, when you're new to prayer, a lot of blockages and a big barrier you might feel that you need to jump over, that you have to say special things. Well, prayer is just a, con a conversation with God. And Ian last week, or no, the week before last, had an excellent sermon on prayer. And if you haven't, um, if you weren't there to see it and you wanted to, we've got it on YouTube. So if you come to me or Ian after the sermon and we can give you the link for that. Now, confession of our sins, oh, that's just telling God about all the ugly bits and imperfections. So then we get to communion which reminds us of God's great love for us. Because Jesus died on the cross to save us from all of our imperfections and ugly bits, and he rose again. Communion celebrates and thanks God for that part of what he did for us. We also have prayers for others where we ask God to help others. The one thing that I think we could do more of, though, is the thanking. I really liked the thanking. When I said thank you, I felt really good <laughs> inside myself. So if you've got a relationship with God and you're working on your relationship with God, I think it very much shapes the way you live your life every day. And the way each of us lives our lives every day is a really powerful witness to others. And one of the things that I have found to be true is that if people look at you and they want what you have in your life, they want the calm, the certainty, the assurance, whatever it is for you that you have, that you have through your relationship with God, they will ask you how to get it. And Paul has some fabulous, fabulous um, information and help for us on what to do when someone asks. You just tell the person what they need to hear. And you can remember at the, at the center of that is that Jesus died on the cross and rose again for us. His death set us free. You don't need to get caught up in the words. All you need to do is tell your story.